I really don't know. Um, I'm not good at this. Richard Wu is the guy that knows that stuff. I don't. I think they're all over the place. But anyway, the um, uh, this reminds me. I had to mention uh, of this book I'm reading, which is fantastic. Um, and I just threw it in the as a recommended book for 160 next semester. The next semester is the first time I'm teaching a cybersecurity responsibilities class, which is intended to be a non-technical class about how to be a manager. Not the CISSP, but this is this is based on uh, my friend at Tufts, Ming Chow, did a class called Cybersecurity for Future Presidents, which was to try to help people. They have to do a lot of it. They have Physics for Future Presidents. It's a common thing. They have it for your colleges. I've heard of it. And it is intended to be a non for non-technical people, but people who will have power. Because they get upset about the fact that, you know, everyone complains that the presidents and the national council of this and that pass laws about things like medicine and science and cryptography, and they don't even know what they're doing, so their laws make no sense. And they always say, well, we can't find a scientist to explain it to us in terms we can understand. And so they end up with like a paid lobbyist that lies to them and tricks them into doing the wrong thing. And all the scientists scream and yell and call them all idiots and wonder why that isn't effective. And you really need to communicate with those people in a way that will help them. And then I'm very much, that's why I did this. I'm, I'm more and more persuaded about this, that we need managers who will take the job of managing over technical things, and they do not need to be technical experts to do it. In fact, they need to ask simple questions like, what data did you collect? Where did you put it? How did you stop the bad guys from getting it? If you can't give me a simple answer to those questions, if it's 300 pages of baffling math, I don't need you. I need someone that can actually answer those questions with answers that make sense. <laughs> And, and that's, um, so anyway, that's the point of this. And this book I've been reading is fantastic, Perfect Weapon. This is from um, the time of Snowden, basically, around his last 20 years of cyber war here. We've been in the middle of a war, a hot war, for 20 years in the cyber domain. I had no idea. China has been hacking us like mad. The current banning of Huawei started eight years ago when Huawei hacked everyone. And this is just the end of a long process. And there was a second leaker they know besides Snowden already, and I think more after him. And they knew about it. And it's just a lot of stuff happened here that I didn't realize. And um, there's a lot of, uh, and this whole thing about when Snowden revelations came out, it's been known for decades that every nation taps everybody else's stuff, especially their phones. So the Germans are tapping the phones and they're giving the data to us. That's part of our partnership. So is the Britain again. The so then when Snowden leaked it and Angela Merkel had to say, they tapped my phone, those rotten bums, it's all bullshit. She knew we were tapping her phone. They're tapping our phone. She had to pretend to be outraged. And the same thing with Apple. Like Apple had to pretend to be outraged that they're tapping the phones. In fact, of course, and the chairman of Huawei last week came out and said, uh, I'm not going to let them read Americans' data. Even if my government orders me to hand over the data, I won't. And I'm like, what are you talking about? You can't work in a country and not obey the laws of your own country. That's madness. You're obviously just lying. And of course. It's this, we have a thing called national security letter. And it's been happening all the time since 9-11. The government comes to Yahoo and Google and everybody. I know. Well, they demand data. Yeah, in fact, first they, they talk about it in this book. It's very first they approached the companies and asked them to please just hand over the data without a court order, and many of them did, like AT and T, because they're closer to the government. The rest said we need a court order, so they came with a court order, and that's it. You're hosed. You either shut down or go to prison, or you hand over your stuff. So everybody's been just handed it over to them, but now they have to pretend they're resisting it to keep their customers happy. Well, we, well, we having trouble with, um, with the CFO got having trouble with. Uh, the CFO, got, got right, the CFO of what? Got arrested in Canada. Yeah, that's that's Huawei. Huawei CFO. That was from that was. Yeah, that was from violating our embargo with Iran. They had been just taking equipment and reselling it and lying about it and falsifying the documents. So the government said that headquarters said headquarters said no, we didn't have that, and they said they sent the people back and they got in trouble. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So they do have her in in custody in Canada to be extradited here. And the CEO is in trouble too. So Huawei is in big trouble. Apparently, they can't take losing the American market, and that's what they're doing. But anyway, this is very. Huawei just announced they're going to set up a security lab in uh, Brussels. In Brussels, yeah. Well, they they, have security lab in UK and also have a security lab in Germany. Okay. That's why the Germans they they no no plan for Huawei products. 
I think you got to put, yeah. Are you going to, anytime soon, implement or create a project um, pertaining to the uh, Ghidra? The what? Ghidra. The, uh, the reverse program that the NSA just released to be able to Yes. Oh, I'm glad you mentioned it. I wanted to, I knew there's a news article. I got it working. Yes, I'm totally planning to. And let me bring it up. I see a question here and I'll get back to it, but I'm glad you reminded me. I knew there was something awesome in the news. Uh, let me bring it up. I've got it on this machine right here. This is by tweet. There's a program released by the NSA to be able to come back to malware and ransomware that we can take and yes. code and actually reverse engineer to, to see what the code is. And I have to remember, it's some stupid name. Um, Robert something. Let me get the news because I, I got put it on this machine, but I can't remember the stupid name. Uh, say we're seeing technical to you. I know he Gidra. Okay, G H I. I have no idea what this is, but I got it running, and it's very interesting. So, uh, I mean, I know what it is. I don't know what the name means. Gidra was a. Um, it's, it's it's based off of a fictional sort of character in Final Fantasy. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, this thing is a replacement for um, Ida Pro. And Ida Pro is one of the really daunting, horrifying products. It's like Photoshop. You open it, and there's like 10 toolbars with 50 icons, and you just want to go home and cry. And everything just presents you with another page of baffling stuff. And usually everyone just gives up. And I have various tutorials that I teach students, and they suffer greatly trying to learn how to use Ida Pro. And it also costs like 5,000 bucks. If you get any, this thing is free and does the same job and is much easier to use. So, so is that what's that? So is that a disassembler? A, it is a disassembler. And not only that, it's not, it's not only a disassembler, it is a source code reconstructor. So this is a crack me. This is going to totally undo some of the homework in my class. In my 126 class, there's a homework where you have these executables and you have to figure out how they work. And if you try to do it in Ida, it's hard work. But here, you open up this, this is a crack me, XE, Windows executable. You open it up and analyze it. Here's the assembly code and here's the C code. It reverses it back to C so you can see the C code. That's that is something only Hopper did before this. There was no free product that did this very well at all. Yeah. Ida Pro does not take you all the way to source code, and it's very limited in the free version. Ida Pro is the standard, and it is the real professional tool like Photoshop, where you can really do everything perfectly with it, but it's a huge learning curve to get it to do anything. This thing is pretty easy to use. You can open your file, you can see all the sections, you can see the assembly code, and you can see a source code version. So this one here, is a password security measure and ask you the password and right here you can see it compares it to this string top secret so top secret is the password you can just read the source code here this makes it as easy to do c code as it is to do android there are several other open sources there's something called x86 uh, something and and x64 are the free versions they're very limited there's a thing called Hopper that can yeah, do this, but Hopper is not free. It has a very limited free version, and it costs like 80 or 100 bucks. And, um, and it, it's not as nice as this. This thing is really nice, and the NSA released it. Uh, I guess they kept the first eight versions for themselves, but now they finally released it open. This is re everybody is excited like crazy about this. It really, because this actually supports all the modern formats. The only version of Ida that's free is like 10 years old. So it does not do 64-bit code. It doesn't do ARM. It doesn't do all kinds of stuff that matters. This thing supports everything. So it's really a huge step forward. So it's totally going to be in my more binary assembly-oriented classes. Probably not this one, but um, maybe. Anyway, there's this is, here we are in the Android class. I'm glad you brought it up. I wanted to show that. Okay, um, so I think it would be cool if we created a class just completely around this. Well, yeah, it, it'll fit in one. It'll fit in like one twenty six or one twenty seven. But anyway, the um, uh, it is a very good tool, and we do cover this material. But we, you don't have this good a tool. This tool is better, and so it's um. Anyway, it's very useful, not just for Windows code, but for everything. So how big is the box? It's it's just about hundred megs, and you have to have Java, so it's really not that big, and cross platform and everything. I mean, it's really a quality product for free. You can't. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Put it, I'm running on the Mac. You could just as well be on Windows or Linux. You know, it's it's really got a lot going for it. Um. Anyway, so let me bring up the slides for today. Let's talk some more about Android. And uh, 
we're really getting to Android. I'm really learning a lot about Android with this new textbook. This is much more infor information than I had in my previous one, and I appreciate it. So, and I decided to break the next chapter also into three chunks, so we can spend most of the class on these two chapters and really understand Android. This is exciting stuff. So, we've been through the first two sections of this chapter, and we're now down to the last section, which is just more things about how Android really works on the inside. And I've gotten up material here for more projects. And by the way, when I taught my uh, Android class at B-Sides, people pointed out like three or four more tools I got to write. So I, I don't know how many I'm going to be able to put in, but there's a whole bunch more Android hacking tools that are very interesting. Um, oh, one other thing I wanted to mention from the news is, you notice we're pretty much ignoring iPhones. And I said, the problem with iPhones is that we're your encryption is so strong that we're totally locked out of iPhones unless you go back five versions. There's not an iPhone you can really get into. They just released an article today. There's been a couple of security teams that have been presenting awesome iPhone research, like explaining exactly how it works. And everyone says, how did you do it? And they won't tell you. And it just leaked out. What they're doing is buying stolen iPhones from the Apple development team that are not locked down. They have these things called development phones that are only partially complete, so they miss all the security features so you can modify the code, and you're illegal to get. And people buy them on the black market, and when you get them, you can't admit you have them or Apple will sue you and put you in jail. And so the researchers have been finding all the secrets that way and then not explaining how they did it. And everybody is talking about, oh, I saw those, but I would never own that. That's dangerous. I don't want Apple hurting me. So Apple really hurts you if you have that stuff and they find out. Because it's straight up stolen industrial espionage stuff. Do they have a right to repair in the United States now? Uh, there is some right to repair, but I don't think it applies. And to jailbreak. Uh, there is a right to jailbreak to move to another carrier. Uh, there is, but you do not have the right to decrypt the encrypted operating system on the phone. And app, even the FBI can't do it with a search warrant. And they've apparently won that in court, more or less. They, they apparently have the right to encrypt it, so you can't get it. They, so you can't get at the OS. They've been doing it for years, and they've locked everybody out. Even the most advanced researchers can pretty much not get in. Yeah. They must have basically someone at Apple must have stolen it and sold it on the black market. That's essentially it. It's essentially like industrial espionage. It's like stolen military secrets. You know, it's totally illegal. And that's the only way to get a phone that you can actually analyze. Apple has really tighter security. And by the way, if you read that book, you'll find out how much the NSA has been leaking like crazy. Apple's security is much more effective than the NSA at keeping their secrets. Yeah. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, Isn't he saying he was a national security advisor, top dog, but he did every time I heard him speak, he doesn't seem really, really technical. Well, I don't, yeah, I don't know. I mean, of course, top executives in general are not very technical and they don't talk that way. That is not their job. They are the public face and they are decision maker for makers of policy. It's a different role. That's why, you know, I'm not going to be teaching another non-technical class to try to reach those people because it is a real important role. And I think being an executive is not technical. It's handling people and policies and it's got to be done. In fact, most people that get there from a technical field always say, I kind of miss the days when I was, you know, programming stuff and hacking things. Now I just have to sit in meetings all day long. But it's a different role. Yeah, there's a question over here. Yeah. Uh, is, don't they, uh, isn't there a way to track them down whoever stole them? Oh, yes, and they have done that. Like there's a time when someone left a, a, product, a development iPhone in a bar about eight years ago, and they totally like got logs and witnesses and hunted them down so Apple could like fire them and punish them. They treat their stuff as secret, like nuclear weapon secret. They're very, very paranoid about it to be leaking out secrets. Yeah? What uh, are your uh, On the news links. And let me bring it up because um, it's, if you go here, um, right here. So what is reverse engineering? A tool like Ghidra. And here's the link where you can download it. So, yeah, on news. So the main page, you click news. And it's earlier news today, Ghidra. Yeah, yeah, it's very nice. Um, at first, it's still pretty complicated, but it's the best, it's far better than the existing free tools. Anyway, so um, let's talk about some of this stuff anyway. And um, we are not going to have a stolen development phone. That's part of why we're not going into iPhone internals. There's no free legal way to get in there. So we're sticking with Android for the moment. But Android has got a lot of interesting stuff. So the first thing, of course, is Unix security. If you do not know Unix permissions, you should learn them. If this is new to you, it can seem sort of confusing at first. Most of us have already learned Unix permissions or Linux permissions before. You have this 10-character string at the start of every file. 
And the first character tells you if it's a directory or a file. A directory is D and a file is dash. And then it's read, write, execute, read, write, execute, read, write, execute. If you see the letter, it's allowed. If you see a dash, it's forbidden. So this file can be read and written, but not executed. And the first three are for the owner of the file. And the next three are for people in the same group as the owner. And the last three is for everybody else. So this file can be read and written to by the owner. And anybody in the owner's group can read it. And outsiders cannot access it at all. And this, the owner is the next thing you see here, system, that's the name of the owner. And the next thing is the name of the group. So there's an account called system, which is the account that runs most internal system processes on Android. And it belongs to a group called package info. And that means anybody else in the package info group can read this. System can read and write it. Nobody can execute it because it's not an executable file. It's a list file. It's just a text file. Somewhere else, there's an executable file that uses this list file for information. And that's the standard um, Linux file structure. And the, this where you get these, these last three ones here are also called world readable, world writable, and world executable. If you put RWX over here on the right, then everybody in the world can do those things. And this is why the classic thing that amateurs do on both Windows and Unix and Android is they're writing an app and they try to read something. It gives them a permission error. So you just make everything readable, writable by everybody. So they don't have to worry about it. And they say, I'll fix that later. And then they don't fix it later. And I found that in, the Gen in that um, horrible GDMD app. I looked at it in JADX and I found they were Shimoding 777, which is mind boggling. That's like the ultimate sloppy, stupid stuff. I do that in some of my code. And then Kaz, by the way, when I taught this uh, class at RSA two days ago, right before the class, Kaz hacked my scoreboard and totally gave himself all the maximum points and everything and deleted other people. And because it's really sloppily written. He's been hacking more on my scoreboards lately, which is perfectly fine. I mean, I, I had to write a new scoring and so my stuff is written in great haste with total sloppiness because if students hack it, that's all good for us. But it's a shame when professional apps that people are putting real data that matters in are written with the same complete slovenly attitude. Yeah. So anyway, you, what's that? He's oh, he's the captain of the, the competition team. He's a student here. Oh, yeah, but he just got a job at a pen testing firm, and so he's really hacking my stuff. He's getting really sharp at pen testing. So <laughs> anyway, um, which is fine. Everyone's encouraged to hack me. Just uh, try not to take down the stuff that really matters, like the lecture notes or something. That would be annoying. But anyway, um, so you can, you can use Shimode to assign permissions, and you can use alphabetic characters, but people usually use numbers. And the numbers are a long extinct system called base eight, called octal. Before there was hex, there was octal, where you take bits three at a time and get a number from zero to seven. And this preserves it because it's natural to have three bits. So seven, so RWX is one, two, and four. So that adds up to seven. So you call that seven, and this is seven, seven, seven. That's, everyone can do everything to that file. That's wide open permissions, a uh, six, four, four, is where the owner can read and write and everybody else can just read it. 755 is what you typically have for an application. The owner can read, write, and execute, and everybody else can read and execute but not write. So this program can be run by anybody, but only the owner can modify it. And you can, of course, have any combination you want, but those are the common ones. And you should know how to turn this number into the permissions. Five is four plus one, so that's this R dash X. Because this, the R is the four, the right is the two and the X is the one. That's the way octal works. There is something explained very badly in your book and very mind boggling called UMask, which is the parameter that determines the default permissions for newly created objects in Unix. And for some ungodly reason, they don't just put the permissions assigned to objects here, they put the opposite of the permissions. So what you have to do is take the two's complement, reversing all the bits in it, and then end it with permissions to find out what it will do. So it's very annoying, and I wouldn't really struggle with it much. It, it, it's just there to give you a headache, and it obviously gave the textbook authors a headache because they described it wrong. <coughs> um, the, the default is like 2-2, two, two, and that is the natural thing. That means um, only owners can write to their file because the two's on the right are turned to zero. Where this is one, permissions are turned to zero by default. Yeah? 0077, is that? 0077 creates this. It means that group and others get no permissions at all because you get the opposite of the U mask. And zero means you get RWX here. So 0077 means everybody can read their own files. And this is what we've seen before. Remember, we, right at the beginning, 
we went into the data data folder and we showed that every app has its own user account and nobody can get in anybody else's account. That's what this does. This is the Android um, sandbox. Every app has its own user account and the default permissions for everything only let every app see its own data and nobody else's data. This is the technical way that sandbox is implemented. <clears throat> but it is, I've never understood this UMass thing. It is the most baffling, backwards, confusing way to accomplish a very simple task. But that's the way Linux does it. There's probably some brilliant reason from 1970 why they did it this way, but now it isn't easy to understand why. Uh, there's also an issue of traversal checking. Traversal checking is off in Windows by default, but it's on in Linux. So if you want to let somebody into a, a folder, they have to have permission to get into the parent folder and the parent folder all the way back. That is, so that if you wanted to protect a folder, like make it read only, you want everything inside that folder to be protected. That's called traversal checking in Windows. And in Linux, it's on by default. So it is a common error people make that they want a file to be visible. So they should load that file to 777. And it's still not visible because they also need to give permissions to the folders on the way up. Yeah. So in your website, you all your things have the directory all visible? Yes. So if you want to let people see your web page, you have to give read permission to all the folders above it. If you don't, nobody will see your web page. That's exactly how you uh, The Apache web server will not let them see the folders above it. And what you often do is, um, but that's not the permissions that stop it. And there is more to it, and I forget the details. Anyway, so um, Droidwall is an example of this. Droidwall is a firewall for Android, and it's just a graphic shell for IP tables. IP tables is the standard Linux firewall that almost everybody uses. And for some reason, the way Droidwall worked, the way they wrote it, was you'd click boxes saying, let this app through, block this app, and it would then create a script file, which it just ran with 777. So you could just put stuff in that file, and it would run with root permissions. Um, this is a privilege escalation, and privilege escalation is so common, I mentioned before, if you have any operating system that's about three months behind on its patches, there's usually a known privilege escalation exploit. Because there are a bunch of things that you have to have high privileges to do, and yet you have to have some way to do them, like changing your password. So there are a bunch of ways to escalate privileges temporarily while you're doing something, and if there's a bug in any of those processes, you can use it to stay up. And that happens over and over again. And almost all privilege escalations amount to finding some way to take something that was only supposed to do one job and trick it into doing another job while you're escalating. Um, so it's really you know, not all that different than, than secretaries at companies that sneak an extra paper in the stuff the boss is signing. You trick the boss into doing something they didn't really mean to do. Um, there's a lot of, this is one of the things that came out about the Trump administration. They're sneaking stuff in and getting him to sign it and taking paper off his desk that he meant to do and he forgets about it and stuff. You know, it's, it's a common issue. And that's privilege escalation. You create something to happen that you're really not authorized to do by tricking the high privilege process into doing it by accident. So file encryption is a big issue. Like you say, the Apple is the king of this. That stuff is so encrypted, the FBI can't get in, nobody can get in. Although Celebrite can get in from Israel and it is rumored in this same article that the way Celebrite learns how to hack in is they have these secret stolen phones. So they can see what's going on in there. Yeah. What's that? Which article? Uh, so it was in the news. I brought it up at the start of class. Um, the one about the uh, death, these development phones from Apple. Oh, okay. Yeah. And it's in. Doesn't it what? They are an Israeli company. There's a few companies that break through encryption. There's Elcom Soft in Russia and Celebrite in Israel and a few others, and they all have a top secret research team that somehow discovers the awesome stuff no one else can discover, and now it's beginning to leak out that in fact they're doing it by stealing it, which makes a lot of sense really. I mean, how are you gonna find out these secrets at Apple other than bribing them and stealing it? Anyway, um, they claim they're just brilliant and they figured it out, but it's probably more realistic to imagine they just stole it. Anyway, so um, if you, a lot of people like to encrypt files, uh, all the, almost all Android apps do encryption and then they encrypt it with private key encryption and they have to hide the key somewhere. So one thing developers have been doing for a long time is they just put the key in the source code. So here's something, um, a real, real code where a SQLite database and then you just have a key right there. Um, I've seen many Android apps that do this. They just put the key in the source code because developers have the belief that the end user doesn't get the source code because they're used to writing languages like C where you compile it and all they get is the um, object code, not the source code, 
Um, in fact, reverse engineering can be done there with tools like that tool we saw earlier with the Ghidra or whatever. That's one of the many tools to help you reverse object code like viruses back to source code. There are tools that can help you do it. But um, in Android, you don't have to do it at all. The source code is very easily reconstructed. And you've been doing it in these classes. So SQLite Cracker, this is a tool somebody wrote that's pretty clever. This just does something. This works for almost every computing system, too. You go and take every string in the app. You make a dictionary and try all those to crack the key. Figuring they probably put the key somewhere in the app. There's a similar trick you differentiate analysts do when analyzing hard drives. If you have an encrypted file on the hard drive, you just take all the words on the hard drive. There's not that many, maybe a million, and try them. Probably they put that key in some file somewhere. Yeah. yeah. In this script, we only uh, send out the, the password, but it's not, it's not sending it to Captain, right? Um, well, it's, uh, no, it does select star, and I don't know if it prints it out, but anyway, it finds the password. And all you need is the password, then you can go back and decrypt it with the password. But it's, um, yeah. Any, any bunch of bits considered part of it? String? Oh, actually, this is this is actually a very good question. How do you find strings? It turns out to be incredibly simple because of history. In the very early days of computing, a decision was made to only use seven bits for a character. And bytes were made eight bits long because the transmission media and the storage media and everything were incredibly inefficient. So they wanted to detect errors. So you have seven bits for the character, and the eighth bit is for parity. You make it so the total number of ones in every byte is either even or odd. And if one bit flips, you can detect that. And this took us to the modern world where everything is using all eight bits, but readable characters only use seven bits. So only half of the bytes in a string are readable. So a string is any sequence of five or more characters that's readable. And that pretty much finds readable strings and nothing else in practice. And that's what people do to hunt through binary objects and find the strings. Is that five an arbitrary number? It's an arbitrary number. You can adjust it. If you make, uh, make it four, you'll see a lot of extra junk. If you make it 10, you'll only see the longest strings. And you always get a few random strings that are, in fact, other binary things like images that just happen to have readable characters. Okay. But since less than half of the characters are readable, a string of five or more is very rare unless it's actually a readable string. So that's a way to get approximately all the readable text out of an app. And it works very well to find passwords and to find all the names of routines and variables so you can kind of guess what it does. It's a very simple way to analyze code when you don't have the source code. And that's why, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, people should be using obfuscators. There are obfuscators for Android that will scramble all the strings into just meaningless garbage so that none of this will work. You can just buy them and run them. People just don't bother. But that would stop most of the reverse engineering techniques that we're using. You would not find anything named password, named credit card number, or login, or anything. It would all just be random scrambled garbage. And that would make it irritating to figure out how to hack in. So the only thing you might do is put data on the SD card. And the problem, of course, the whole point of the SD card is you can take it out of the phone and put it in your camera or your, your other device. So, of course, it doesn't have permissions on it. The other device couldn't read it. In fact, they're usually formatted with FAT32, which is the FAT system had no permissions anyway. That was the point of it. It started with floppy disks. The FAT system was intended for portable devices. So it didn't have any ability to have permissions or anything. So if you save something on the SD card, it's available. Any device that can reach the SD card can read it. Now, Android decided to write, require a permission to write to the SD card, but it, there's no point having permission to read from it. And, uh, and besides, you could just pull it out and put it in another device. So uh, your SD card is often in these places in a slash SD card directory. And a lot of Android systems have simulated SD cards in addition to possibly real SD cards for various purposes. And uh, there now is a permission required to read the external storage. So your app cannot read the SD card without permission, but you can just take it physically out and put it in another computer and it can read it. So anything you put on the SD card is not very safe. And uh, this happened a lot. WhatsApp stored its database on the SD card. I don't know why you would do that. And of course, on any app with the permission could read it. It was AES encrypted, but that's the wrong kind of encryption, as I keep yelling about. That's private key encryption, so you have to put the key somewhere. So they just put the key in the source code. So somebody just wrote a tool that will take the key, and extract it, and the WhatsApp extract tool totally reveals everybody's WhatsApp messages. Uh, this mm -hmm. happens all the time. Um, yeah. Do you use WhatsApp on iPhone yet? Or uh, I have not heard of it on the iPhone. It's much harder on the iPhone. The only thing about I, the only way I know to get data off an iPhone is to run a backup. And then you don't get the operating system, you just get the apps 
that choose to back up. And by the way, oh, this is what I was talking earlier today that I already said about. Um, so the, it's all posturing. So Apple made this big deal about not letting the FBI and the San Bernardino shooters iPhone. They said, we protect the privacy of our customers. Our phones are encrypted. We won't let anybody in, not even the FBI, not even with search warrants. So it's all posture because the thing that baffled me, now Apple did that, is how can they do that? Because the number one problem with encryption is that it locks out your own customers. The number one problem with passwords is it locks out your own users. If you have any kind of security barrier, the first people affected are your own legitimate employees that forget their password or forget their ID card, and you have to have some way of letting them in, and that gets expensive and irritating really fast. And until Apple did this about five years ago, everybody had a backdoor into their own stuff. You could go to the manufacturer and say, I lost my password, please get in, and they had a way in. That was the old system. Apple no longer has that. And I said, how can their customers tolerate this? I forgot my password. I have to throw away my phone and buy another phone. Are people going to do that? And what happened is Apple has another big issue, which is people lose their phone. And they drop it in the toilet and stuff. And then they lose all their data. So they make everybody, they highly encourage you to turn on iCloud backup. So there's a cloud backup of everything. And that is not encrypted. It's encrypted with a key they have, and they just hand that over to the government all the time. So in practice, everybody's data is still going to the cops, but Apple can posture and say, we don't let the cops in. We're heroic defenders of privacy. The NSA and the government is all evil, and we're saving you from it. It's all just a farce. It's all theater. Everybody, of course, is complying with law orders and giving away their data, but they're trying to pretend it's not happening. Anyway, it's very interesting to read that book. Yeah. But I thought that Apple, okay, they can continue their cloud stuff goes on AWS, Azure, oh, yeah. Google, yeah. Drive. It's common. But when they do that, they they with the key the, the key and the metadata. They, 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 they it they is encrypt the, the it is encrypted, right? but they have the key. Because has, but not, but not the cloud. Yeah, it doesn't mean I don't think Azure has the key. Apple yeah. has the key though. And and so they can get it and they do just hand it over to the cops. So the point is, if you turned off iCloud and then stored your secrets on the phone, you'd be safe, but you'd also take the responsibility of losing your data if you forget your PIN. So that's not something any normal person would want. But that's why, you know, the, that's why the FBI, uh, the FBI chairman Ray was talking about this again, they get a real attitude because they say you're enabling terrorists and criminals to get away with stuff. And that is certainly one valid way to look at it. Normal users use iCloud and we can see their stuff. But you can make your iPhone so secure that the cops can't get in. And the FBI's position is, why would anybody want that? What are you doing anyway? And on we go. You know, this is uh, the eternal battle between the privacy and the law enforcement people. But the data the iPhone Yes, you can turn it off. But Apple will constantly bug you and try to get you to turn it back on. And people, cynical people say it's because they charge money for it. But I think, to be fair, the fact is 99% of users really want that because they'll say, I want my privacy and turn it off, and then they'll drop their phone in the toilet and they'll say, I need my data. And Apple, Apple is right that most people should just put their stuff in the cloud. That will meet the use case of most of their customers. Even if they whine about it, they really will be glad they had a backup in the cloud when they drop their phone in the toilet, which people do a lot. Anyway, um, it's like the number one repair job. Uh, Anyway, um, so logging is there to help developers write their app. And if you run one of those tools, I think it was Android Bugs, and maybe it was the other one, QArc, it will actually tell you if logging is turned on at all for your app, that's a security flaw. The production version of your app should not allow any logging whatsoever. I've never seen any app do that. They're all logging stuff like crazy. It would be a really good idea not to. But anyway, Apps can, any app can read logs and read the permissions, but that's only in older versions of Android, which I didn't know until I read this book. Uh, ever since 4.1, Android does not let anybody read the logs except system apps. So if you don't have a rooted phone, it's actually not as big a risk as I thought. So maybe it's not such a big deal to put secrets in the log. It's still like an unsanitary poor practice, but they did put a layer of defense on it. And this is why, for example, local storage of unencrypted data, I say, I tried to complain about it on the iPhone, but now I really had to stop complaining because the iPhone itself is so encrypted, I can't get the data off. So even if the app developer put it there in plain text, the iOS system has encrypted it so much that it's effectively safe. And in this, maybe I should stop whining about the logs because Android has put it in this fence. It means not very many people are going to be getting those logs. Are you going yeah. to study uh, iOS in the next coming weeks? 
uh, I'm not planning. I don't think iOS will be in this class much because we can't find out anything about it. iOS is, is not the only version. The only thing you can learn about iOS is many versions out of date. After Apple locked everybody out, nobody knows what's going on with iOS anymore, <laughs> except a few people. The, the iOS projects I had are all work on my iPhone 4. They're pathetic. Now, there are a few new tools that work on some modern, more modern, unless I find a way to make a few modern devices that are jailbroken, which is not easy. We really can't do anything much fun with iOS. The only thing we can do is the black box we did a few weeks ago, where you just run the app and look at the network channel. So look at the internals of iOS is sort of superhuman these days, whereas Android is wide open. So, is there an emulator for iPhone? No, there's no emulator like this. All there is is an emulator that comes in Xcode and it doesn't let you see the internals of the OS and it's not really an iPhone. There's, there's no virtual machine. That's right, it's totally a secret. Um, it, that's why it's not really much fun to get an iPhone internals. It used to be. It used to be a whole hacking community with all these jailbreaks and all these special apps and everything to mess with your iPhone, and Apple locked everybody out. Apple was very vigorous about patching every vulnerability, and after a while they got them all, and, and now it's up to where you can get a million bucks for every vulnerability that breaks in the iPhone, so they're not available in the free tools anymore. Although I read there is a jailbreak for iOS 11, so under certain conditions, you can create a jailbroken iPhone with a relatively modern version, but the only way to do it is to have an old phone that has an old version of iOS 11 and jailbreak it. You know, the problem is they now automatically update too. It is quite a feat to have a jailbroken iPhone, and I can't find a way to make enough of them to give homework in it anymore. So probably we're not going to do iPhone internals at all in this class. But there are some tools I hear about. If there becomes some way to make a practical homework, I would love to do it. And we used to do it. But... Um, it's, that's why I, I tried to announce right from the start, in case you want to study the iPhone, you're not going to get much of it in this class. And I don't think you're going to get it in any class. And if somebody's doing that, I would like to know how. Um, anyway, so you can enable these permissions. If you have root permission, of course, you can use PM and you can just change the permission of apps. But of course, that's a rooted phone. If you have rooted Android, it's not surprising to change things. But then you can give them permissions. And then, of course, insecure communications. We've already done this quite a bit, of course. Uh, some apps send unencrypted traffic, and that's ridiculous. You can just see it with Wireshark or anything. They've seen the ones that don't validate the TLS certificate, so you can just put burp in the middle and give it a fake certificate, and it will just give you the data with a key you know, so it might as well be plain text. We've been through that, and you just see HTTPS here, but in fact, it's all being sent with the wrong key, so it might as well have been plain text. Although, to be fair, I did have to be in the middle to read it, and if it was plain text, everybody could read it, so it's slightly better to do this than plain text, but it's still very substandard and it does not meet the American government requirements for security. If you have a generic security statement like we protect the privacy of the users, the Federal Trade Commission will punish you if you do this. This has happened to Credit Karma and Fandango. This is considered not up to industry standards anymore, protecting the user. Um, it's about what keep the, the security community strongly recommended security pinning for about five years. And about two years ago, they said, don't do it. And what happened is I saw a nice graph of this. 0% of people did it. Then it started going up to 2%. Then they told us to quit doing it. And it went up to 5% because they don't understand the inertia. It takes people years to learn it. So they're still catching on. Oh, we're supposed to do this. And they haven't yet heard, no, no, don't do that. So anyway, certificate pinning. The problem, certificate pinning should make you much more secure. It's where you not only check with the trusted certificate authority to see if this is a valid certificate from somebody you trust but also, inside the app, you do something like record the serial number of the real certificate. So it will not accept any imitation. And that's a second layer of defense. And that means even if you put the BERP trusted certificate in the trusted store, you still can't connect with that app because it knows you're looking at a fake certificate. It sounds like a great idea. The problem, as it always is, is key management. Now what happens if you switch certificate providers or your certificate expires and you have to change it? How do you tell the apps to now accept the other certificate. They'll all reject it. So you can't update your app and you can't update your server. So it's already a good idea and a couple of years later, you're really sorry you did it. And so they said, actually this is turning out to be far more of a headache than it's worth. But anyway, there are apps doing this and if they are, it's actually difficult to test them, right? Because they will not let you put burp in the middle. They're using really CPS and you can't lie to them. So there are ways to bypass it. Yeah. Uh, burp does. Yeah. Uh, 
the no, the app will have some kind of test for the certificate. It could take any part of it. It could use the key or the name of the provider. In fact, after a while, they said what you should do is just use the name of the certificate authority. So it'll know if you're going to the wrong certificate authority. But the app does some kind of test. There are various ways to do it. Some kind of way of recognizing the official correct certificate and rejecting imitations. So if you want to defeat this, there are various solutions. One is to add a custom CA to the certificate store. Um, I'm not, here are other ones, override a package CA cert with another one. Um, and the one we've done here, of course, is modify the code. That's what we did for the, um, the Indian app. Um, you can just mod take away the certificate verification code. Um, you did something like that in the Indian app. And there's a thing called Frida. Frida is apparently the new product to replace another thing that's coming up here for Obsidia Substrate. This is actually a very interesting technique. And I've read about it in years. I've never had any projects in any of my classes doing it. I'm hoping to add Frida to this class. And we'll talk about this. This is another level of hacking, which is pretty exciting. Uh, if you can, and you already have seen this. If you think about Windows root kits. So you're running Windows. The way Windows works, you have user land applications like your browser and Microsoft Word and everything. And if they want to do something like make a network connection, they have an API call where it calls a kernel routine that Microsoft wrote that says, please open a connection on the internet. Please send this data to a server. So root kits hook those with API calls. So when you try to call the system routine, it deflects that call and runs poison code instead that does something different than what you asked it to do. And you can install that kind of hook in your Android system. So you don't modify the app, but you take over the system calls it's making and cause them to do something else. That's like putting the app in a virtual machine, sort of. Essentially, virtual machines are just a big root kit where all the calls that your app makes to the system are, in fact, deflected and going somewhere else. So um, that's what these, that's what Frida does, and that's what the older tool City of Substrate did. And it is a way to hack things without even taking it apart by changing the environment around it. Sort of like one thing you could do to hack into something is reinstall it on a different phone that is less secure. And that's essentially what Frida does. You lower the security of the phone around the app to get in. And you could lower the security of the phone to where it lies to the app and tells it it's going to the real SSL place that it thinks it should go. Anyway, so um, Here's the flaws. People often turn off the SSL validation. Here's a little bit about what's really happening inside the apps we've been observing. They can add, they can hack the host name verifier method so it always returns true. And they're doing what Cydia will do. They can override the system apps. This is the thing about object-oriented coding. If there's a method called host name verifier provided by Google, Android, you can write your own host name verifier and you can overload it so yours is the one that's used by your app and not the real one. And coders learn this. You can just make your own imitation, and your app will use this one, and then it will always believe that everything is true. And this is what people often do because they can't write good cryptography code, and they keep getting error messages, and users keep complaining, so they just turn it out. This way. It's like putting a penny in the fuse box. They just turn off the safety features to make it work. And the end result is everybody loves you. The errors go away. Everybody's using the app. They're all happy, and it isn't until some jerk like me said you wrong report that anybody's complaining. That's why they really don't want to hear it. They do. Everything's fine, everybody's happy, just shut up, which is what security people usually get. So um, trust manager is another place to put it. Anyway, WebView, this is another one. I, 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 this is what happens to the US military academies. I, I announced for Straxis, they had an app that had WebView. You can put WebView in your app, and it will now let you view web pages inside your app. And that makes it more beautiful, and it lets you put Facebook and Twitter and everything inside your app. But it means that if you have short-circuited out security features, all those other websites are now insecure. So uh, that's an issue here, and that's WebView. WebView runs in the apps context, and now you can have the developer hook it like they might have on the previous slide, so you have your custom browser that is not secure anymore. Um, and you control it with these web settings class adjustments. So you can say what web setters are allowed to do. You can make it so WebView can get to the content providers and read database. You can let it access files. You can let it access files from URLs. So people can put in file colon slash 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 to refer to files, which is just asking for it. Because I can put an iframe on my web page that opens something file colon slash 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 and puts a system file from a web page. If you allow this, um, you can allow uh, universal access from file URLs. So that it's something that's loaded from an HTML file can access content from another origin. This is really asking for it. Um, you can have JavaScript enabled. 
which lets me add code on my page that runs on your phone and so on. There's just many options available to you and many of these turned out to be extremely dangerous, which is pretty obvious when you look at them, but there's a lot of apps to let you do awful things. Like now I can have my custom broken website remembering your passwords. That'd be even more fun. So anyway, um, we'll talk about this. So exploiting WebView, you can send a person's thing. You just could file colon slash 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 and refer to local data so I can just refer to exploits on the phone and run them, or I can read code off the phone, local file inclusion. Um, and this one is the one that got a lot of press. It was in the previous book too, was JavaScript interfaces. You can choose JavaScript on a web page, and you can have a JavaScript interface message that runs Java code. So you can run the native code on the phone from a website. That's just mind blowing. <laughs> That's code execution. You're just viewing a web page, and it's running code on your machine. This is like just handing away a shell. And of course, there's a whole bunch of exploits using this when this is turned on. Um, so here's the one of the many vulnerabilities about it from 2012. Add JavaScript interface arbitrary code execution. Any app with target SDK below 17 has this on by default. So you can just run code from inside the web page. This is the way Microsoft web servers were in the days of Windows NT 3.5. Microsoft web servers, you could just go in the URL where you have like ccsf.edu and you could type dot dot slash dot dot slash uh, Windows System32 CMD.exe and get a command prompt and execute commands right through the web page. And that's what this is. It's pretty mind boggling. Anyway, um, and here's, so uh, there's a Drozer module to scan for this and find it, looking for vulnerable.js. Of course, that's the vulnerability scanner like anything else. And there's other fun things like a clipboard. This is actually pretty exciting. I mean, you use the clipboard all the time, right? You go to one site and clip something, put it in another. What about that means that the clipboard can be read by any app? That's the whole point of it. So that means the malware on your phone can steal anything you put in the clipboard. Now, what do you put in the clipboard? Passwords. This is how password managers work. They put the password in the clipboard and paste it in the form. So it exposes it. This seems like a really serious problem. The clipboard is the worst place to put them. And you put everything in the password. I put everything in the clipboard, man. How am I supposed to get anything done without putting everything in the clipboard? And the whole point is to make you more secure by having some long password I can't type. So I copy and paste it. This is actually pretty disturbing. I'm still processing the consequences of this. Like I said, I need to write some new projects where we do some of this stuff. This is sort of disturbing. But hey, uh, Drozer can totally let you see what's in the clipboard. You can totally find the passwords that are in there. Yeah. So the hashing and other things that uh, password managers in the browsers do are ultimately copy pasted? Yes, this is the problem. The storage on, of the password on the operating system is encrypted, and the storage in the password manager is encrypted, but it has to decrypt it, put it in the clipboard, and put it in the form to log in. And you can steal it at that point. This is like if I did have a keylogger, you can HTTPS all day. I steal the key presses before they're encrypted. It's actually pretty scary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right. It only has one thing, but if you just keep pulling it, it has the password for a few seconds there, and it's not encrypted. Uh, it's pretty disturbing. Yeah. Is this for all, for all the password managers, or for most of them? That's a good question, and I think it. I don't know the answer for sure, but I think it's pretty much for all of them because I don't know how else it can put the password in the web page. It has to copy it from one app and put it in another. Yeah. Autofill, that's a very good question. Autofill is the built-in password manager, and I don't really know. I wonder. Um, I know I did this at Hope a few, or a few years ago. Uh, uh, from six years ago, every browser just put passwords in RAM in plain text, and you could see it. And I saw students doing a project where they get passwords out of RAM. They fixed that about three years ago. So you could write a browser that doesn't expose the password more, and maybe people have done that. People like Chrome is usually pretty smart and Firefox is pretty smart, IE catches on later. It's a good question. They might not use the clipboard for that manager. That might be a reason why you're better off using the built-in. And the ones that are browser extensions, I don't know if they use the clipboard or not. I bet they did and I bet they're slowly learning not to. It would be fun to analyze and see. Yeah. If you get your uh, password manager to insert your start out password and you haven't hit enter yet, if you copy paste, those stories, often you don't, I don't think you get your password. 
Yes, most of them will not let you copy like the dots and paste it in another. They block yeah. that, but I don't think it means they don't use the clipboard. I think it just block that operation. But it's a very good question, and I don't really know the internals. It would be a very good project to analyze the internals. By the way, I should mention something that came up at RSA today. I was at RSA, and there were two lawyers, eminent lawyers in the speaker's room. These are not lunatics. And they both said, when I'm around my phone, and I talked about buying a Toyota, all the advertising for the next week is for Toyotas. So the phones are listening to you, even when you're not making a call, and they're basic advertising. Now, I've heard this from a lot of people. Now, I think this is insane. I, not because it's not technically possible, but because... The legal consequences are mind-boggling. I can't believe that any phone carrier would actually do that. But it occurred to me, we could find out. If some student's interested, all you have to do is get a phone and read a bunch of brand names into it, and then go to another room and read those brand names without a phone with another student, and then monitor your email and see how many emails you get and see if there's a difference. Um, but it would be easy to do a scientific test. I assume that's not true because it's too horrible to be true, but that's not logic, you know? Like our, the hippies said, the government is putting LSD in the water. I said, oh, you made that up, and that was true. A bunch of stuff that is too horrible to believe, in fact, is true. So it's worth testing. I've heard this from so many people, and not stupid people, that, that I can't just discard it without the experiment. So if someone's interested, that would be a good project. Yeah. You've done that. And what? Yeah, me and a couple buddies, we were talking about a particular topic, and we tried to figure out some of the trigger words. Yeah. Talking about um, what you want to buy or planning on looking at this or I need this. Yeah. And then you go on your web browser and, you know, the, the ads are showing you exactly what you're talking about. So you, that this is what people tell me, and I, it's hard for me to believe, so I would like to do a scientific test. If it turned out to be true, it would be headline news and lawsuits and everything else. Um, it's, I assume this must be a psychological error. It can't really be that horrible, but we should do a scientific test and find out. It wouldn't be hard to do a careful test and either prove this is true or prove that it's not true. Anyway, um, so there's these things called local sockets that listen on your machine. Some of them are network sockets like this. And the thing about those is those also have no permissions. If you're listening on network socket, every app can send data to it. There's also something called Unix sockets, which I think Windows calls named pipes, which are little data objects that listen to every app and move data to another app and act like network sockets, but they're not actually tied to a network address. And both of them are ways, like a clipboard, of moving data from one app to another, and there are no permissions to restrict what app's allowed to look at them. So they're considered a security risk. Uh, ever since Microsoft went to Windows Vista, Microsoft operating system has about 20 of these running all the time, and high numbered ports like 50,000, and I tried for years to find out what they are, and I can't find anybody telling you what they are, but all you have to do is net stat minus an in any Windows system, and there's a lot of these running. Microsoft is doing a lot of talking to itself, and I don't know what it's doing with all that stuff. So and it, net, net stat. Net stat. Yeah, net stat minus an shows you all the listening ports. Do it on a Windows machine. You'll see a bunch of junk listening even when you're not running anything. The operating system is talking to itself over the network adapter extensively ever since Windows Vista. And I really don't know what that weird stuff is. Um, so you can use Wireshark, of course, to see network traffic. We've been here before. And um, there are a lot of other vectors. There's native code. Now, most of the code on your Android phone is Java running in a Java virtual machine in Smalley code. We've spent most of this class analyzing it. There is some native code actually written in C, compiled to real binary, and then you need a tool like IDO or that new thing from the NSA to read it. And this has all the old uh, defects that we go through in the 127 class in great detail, buffer overflows and format strings and all the, uh, all the vulnerabilities. And Android has some of those too, but there's not too much of that native code in there. It's mostly Java. Um, there's also application backups that's true by default. This is like I say, the vulnerability in the iPhone is not the phone itself, it's that you back it up to iCloud and then you get the data off iCloud. You can also back it up to your machine of iTunes and then you can see the data. So that's one way to see what data is on the phone. And, and you can of course do that with your Android. Everybody has the same issue. They're gonna lose their phone so they want to back up. So most apps are able to be backed up. You can run a phone backup and it'll back up the data. Um, you can, there's a debuggable flag if you turn that on, this is, I didn't know this, I got it, I really got to make projects. You can turn on a debuggable flag and then you can debug the app while it's running. That sounds fantastic. And I'm sure like some phones are sold with the USB debugging, there are probably some apps shipping with debugging turned on and then you can just go right in the code. So we got to play with that. Um, 
You can, this lets you do code execution within the app. This is what Drozer does. That Drozer agent on the phone that lets you do things, it's letting you eject things this way. You can eject stuff. So if an app was to ship, and this is why I got to just start loading apps. Probably one of the top 100 apps did this. And this is just giving you a shell on the device. This is hot stuff. That's why I'm really excited about this Android internal. So there's so many new interesting ways to be wrong beyond what I used to know about. Um, so then you have complete data compromise. So this is the Civ app. And the Civ app, of course, has this bug so you can see it. So you can do run as Civ SQLite, and you can just print out the passwords with because the app has debugging turned on. So you can just ask it, please hand over the passwords, and it will just do it. So it's pretty awesome. Um, all right. And uh, I think we're nearly to the end of this, so I think I'll keep going. Let's see. Um, otherwise, we'll take, no, we're near the end, so we'll be at the, all right, so root detection, we've already talked about in the Indian app, um, there's certificate pinning, where it checks the TLS certificate, there's root detection, where it detects if your phone is rooted, and we saw that before, and of course, both of these can be overcome if you modify the app, yeah. So, uh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah. did you say the industry said don't do pinning, or do you? Uh, well, pinning was, pinning is considered more secure, but it turns out to be very hard to maintain. So there was a big push to do it, and then they said, don't do it, and they pushed instead a, uh, it's like Windows Microsoft user account control. They put it in Vista, so it asks you every time you do anything. So it drove everybody nuts, and they just turn it off. And then they made it weaker, so people leave it turned on. And so instead of certificate pinning, what they now recommend is strict uh, transport security, which causes your browser to remember the certificate, and if you go back again, it will, it will not, not accept it if it has changed. That is considered to be less irritating and more maintainable. It's the same issue as like if you have a security officer that tells you you can't do anything, you just cheat and sneak around. You have to have rules that aren't too annoying or nobody will obey them. Anyway, so there's an app that refuses to run on the rooted device, the Indian uh, identity app that's super important. And as we did in the projects, you can just go patch that app by commenting out the code that calls the root detector. And this calls root beer, which is a common open source root detection code. And you just comment it out, recompile the app, and now it'll run on a rooted phone. And you can do that for certificate pinning or anything else if you're willing to modify the app. Um, so you can, but here's what I was talking about, manipulating the runtime. This is like root kidding your Android. You can change the Android API calls so they don't do the same thing anymore. And the app that runs is unaware of the fact that it's in a different world and things are not doing what it expects to happen. That's what happens with root kits. It's what happens with virtual machines. And you can do it voluntarily. And there are various programs that do this. The original one was Cydia Substrate, which was also used on iPhones primarily. It had to do the app store that you got on a jailbroken iPhone. And you would, the substrate, you would change the operation of the operating system underneath the app and you could modify what it did. This is one way to hack into apps without actually messing with the app itself. And you can run this on Android, but it seems to me like it's pretty much abandoned. And the Android version didn't work very well. And uh, Frida is the new one that does this. And it, under active development, seems to work just fine. And I found some tutorials. And like I say, this is my plan to add a Frida project to this class. So we can practice doing this. Um, but I don't have it yet, but it is a good idea. And I certainly will not be able to do all the fun things I learned at RSA and stuff how to do it. I, I know like enough for another 10 or 20 projects. So realistically, I'll probably only figure out two or three of them this, this time, but it's always uh, an endless chain of more fun things in hacking. That's why we're in this field. Yeah. Where did you see the RSA do you like? I didn't attend hardly any talks, but I just even talked in my session. I was too busy teaching her stuff, but I, I had, a lot of students had ideas. Oh, oh, oh yeah. And, and it, it, so I, I was just talking to people. That's right. often, after you've heard the talks enough times, it's more fun to just talk to the people. That's why I say most of us do lobby con now. You just talk to the people. But for the first seven years, I watched the talks, and they were interesting. Then they started out, got to be all the same, and then you started to know the people, you know. Well, what's, what's all what you're at? Um, I went to the speaker's lounge. So were you in the North Hall, South Hall? I was in the West, Moscone West. Oh, I was in the South Hall working. Yeah, that's good. Well, I'm glad you were there. Yeah, anyway, and I was at B-Sides too. You know, these security cons are very, very informative, and there's many different experiences to have there. I know you were there volunteering at B-Sides. How did you like volunteering? That's what I thought. You make friends, you do something useful, you get some respect, you know? And it can usually the job offers and everything I say. Volunteering is very good. It's, it's a way to, it, it, you immediately get respect because you are doing a good thing. And, and like I said, it was a, 
some of you guys might know uh, Shannon Moore from that class. Yeah. They're, they're, from what I understand, they're pretty prominent in the sort of out and about sort of hackers. Uh, oh, yeah. The, the culture. So that's why I think it would be awesome if I still got to get with them and see what they can come through. Sure. This is great. And, you know, that's why volunteering is one of the best ways to have fun at these cons. I highly recommend it. But uh, you can't go wrong. There's lots of good things to do. I spent most of my time at B-Side doing the CTF, which was very interesting. So there's just lots of fun things to do. Um, just find something you like and do it. So we're at 7G. This is the end of Chapter 7. And I think we have music this time. I, I think I know what's been happening in my music if the HDMI port is stealing the music. But anyway. Right now I'm plugging in with an adapter that doesn't have HDMI. So. The new what? Uh, those are the ones I've seen there, but there's a few more. If you look at the links at the bottom of the page, there's a few more I've found that I'm hoping to write projects for, but I think I won't get to this semester. I, uh, I forget them, but they're all at the bottom of the page. I've been adding new news links to the bottom of that page. Are you there tomorrow, sir? RSA? Uh, probably not. I'm pretty beat. Uh, I'm probably just going to sleep tomorrow. Yeah. And I've got to prepare a new class. My, my Saudi Arabian class starts next week, so i got to get that ready. So. And I'm not going there. It's online. But I just like to prepare the website and stuff. So. What's that? The class? It's going to be 123 at first, and probably 124 also. Anyway, um, at 6 in the morning, because that's uh, 5 p.m. there. The time difference is one of the many obstacles to dealing with, but I'm, I'm planning to cope with it. Oh, good. Besides, I didn't know. Besides Sacramento, they're all over the place. They're very good, too. They're always free or cheap and they're good community. All right. I guess I'm going to start this in five seconds. So jump aboard if you want to be aboard. Okay. So what command makes the permissions like that? That's 644. R is 4, W is 2, so that first one is 6, and R minus minus is 4, so it's 644. That's how it works. Anyway, uh, you know, I don't suppose it's absolutely essential that you know that, but one of the, as you go on in hacking, you'll have to learn your Linux permissions and your octal at some point. All right. So which data was widely available, but then restricted to Google Apps only in Android 4.1? Okay, that is the logs. The logs used to be available to every app, and then they made it system permission, so only internal operating system files can see it. All right, which feature is risky but often used by password managers? Yeah, the clipboard. There you go. I, know. I know, that's pretty exciting news. I'm thinking, that's making me think, man, I'm in trouble. I use that all the time without a second thought. Anyway, uh, so which component lets code execution come in over JavaScript, which is completely insane? Yeah. Wait a minute, I don't think there's a right answer on there. Oh, well, okay, okay, fair enough. I had to read the question more carefully. There is a right answer on there. It's part of the web views. It's the JavaScript Java interface, which is in web views. So is, that's the component. That's a little brutal. Who wrote this stuff? Anyway, um, all right. So I'll see who survived this brutal challenge, sort of like CTDC. Uh, a brutal challenge, but at least it was the same for everyone. So here's the survivors. M, you know, J, that's one I know. K, I don't know, but I have to tell me a little bit more. 
and Mary looks like more or less a real name. So uh, this person I know, the other two would probably be well advised. The other two, oh, you're Maribel, right? Good. That's that one. Good. I, this one I know. Good. Okay. Okay. And uh, K. Carla, right? Good. Okay. Good. Good. Okay. Good. Good. Thank you. Then I have names. You'll get points. That's your prize for giving me a real name. So um, let me save this. Oh, Chesedges, thank you for telling me. In fact, I think there's one earlier I forgot about. Uh, yes, let's see. Um, so here's someone that asked if I can explain the baseband chip. Oh, yes. Um, and the answer is disappointing. I don't really know this. This was in my first time I went through this. We talked about baseband hacking. There's, you know, there's people that hack computers through the firmware in the motherboard. And there's a vulnerability that gets a lot of press about how Dell computers have a remote control listening network socket in the motherboard that is listening all the time, even when the computer is turned off. And you do it to do things like power cycle racks of routers remotely. And therefore, um, this is kind of like IoT. If you could get access to it, you could control the machine, even despite all the operating system safeguards. And in the same spirit, the baseband is the radios in your phone. And there are attacks that mess with the firmware that controls the radio module. And that is at a lower level than the whole operating system, so all the firewalls and permissions and everything don't apply. And it's, it's also kind of weird to figure out what you can do there, but that is one type of hacking that we considered, and I haven't got that in the, um, in the projects. We were gonna do it when I first started this class, but it's not the, one, the biggest risk to people, so I haven't gone there. That's more like the hardware hackers in the radio. But it is an interesting issue. And if we go into the IoT, I'm hoping if we hold on to Liz, she'll teach an IoT class because she's good at this. The, inter the new Internet of Things, you take the little gadget, you pull out the firmware, mess with the firmware, and put it back, and now it's poison. That is real important. It's a whole field of security in itself. And it's at a whole lower level. And what happens is IoT devices have their own strange assembly language, and you have to learn it. Yeah? So in a radio propagation theory, yeah. baseband is the unmodulated the intelligence of the signal it is sort of gets translated so that would be like audio. it is but this is not the same it's sort of an analogous use of the term it's not really the same as the baseband in like an am signal right. yeah they just call it the baseband okay. it's the module that, that handles the rf transmissions yeah is it, is it like that, that device rf1 to some extent it's basically like a pineapple or for like instant. yeah well it's a part of every phone it's the radio module itself just like the nick and just like the motherboard, it's the low-level hardware components. They have code in them too, and you can hack that code. And if you do, it blows past all the defenses because it's at a level before it even gets to any of those defenses. And, but it's very hard to do because it's tied to the hardware. So you can't really make a spreading virus that will infect too many devices. It only affects that one model of hardware. So these are the things that the NSA uses for tailored attacks to have one target, then they poison the firmware on their device. You can do it one by one for custom devices. This is why we're not supposed to use Huawei anymore because they can poison the hardware by modifying the chips in the one device. And that's a devastating attack, but it's not something that you do to a large bunch of people all at once. It's something you do to one person at a time. And it really gets down into like radio and fundamental low-level computing building stuff. Anyway, so the other one is uh, ready to Shimode. Yeah, Shimode 7XX. Yeah, I think that one's already been answered. Shimode 77 is the same as RWX for everyone. Yeah, Shimode is the command you use, and you can specify the permissions with RWX. You can do A plus R to make all plus read, or you can use the numbers, which is more common, like uh, 666. Anyway, all right, well, I think I'm going to um, shut this down. Hopefully, I've answered the questions as much as possible, and I'll go upstairs and help anybody who wants to work here. Been a lot of action in the lab lately, so there may be a lot of questions up there. All right.